In this unit, Study Unit 6, Chapter 8, we will be discussing managing employees' roles in service delivery. Up until this point, we have discussed several topics. We've introduced services marketing, where we touched on the service value mix, and then we also had the dimensions. We also spoke about managing service quality, as well as understanding your customers. We also discussed service development and design, and then in the previous unit, we talked about the service delivery process. In this unit, we will touch on how you can manage your employees' roles in service delivery. So six learning outcomes for this unit with the coinciding page numbers. First of all, demonstrate the importance of creating a service culture in the organization. Then be able to discuss the importance of contact staff as boundary spanners. Then define and describe the nature of the concepts of empowerment and enfranchisement. Then be able to illustrate the critical importance of service employees in service delivery customer service quality perceptions and customer satisfaction, then identify the unique demands placed on boundary spanning employees, this links with learning outcome two, and then lastly describe the function of internal marketing in the service organization. In the next slide you will see a video of Sir Richard Branson where he discusses putting your staff first, your customers second, and your stakeholders third. This video is linked on Ifundi as well as in the slide, so make sure you watch this video to get his perception. Now, employees are pivotal in ensuring optimal quality in service delivery and making sure that customers' needs and expectations are constantly met. Now, we've touched on the concept of frontline employees and back office employees in the previous units, but in this unit, you will see how vital of a role they play to ensure that your service is seen as optimal in terms of quality and to make sure that your customers always have their needs satisfied and then that their expectations are met. Unfortunately, negative customer experiences are often attributed to undesirable employee behavior and attitudes. One day you will go to a service organization and there are friendly staff, and the next time they might not be that friendly or they even are maybe disrespectful and lack the desire to assist you. And this all boils down again to the heterogeneity concept or dimension. Now you will also see that there are several reasons for deviant service employee behavior, and this include employees who do not understand their roles, employees who experience conflict between the expectation of customers and those of management, inappropriate staffing appointments, inadequate service delivery systems and processes, employee remuneration that is not market related, in other words they are underpaid and overworked, inadequate service competencies and inappropriate service culture, poor service inclination, inadequate empowerment, and lack of teamwork. So those are a few reasons why employees might be undesirable in terms of their behavior and attitude. However, there is a marketing aspect in all roles, tasks, and departments of a service organization. It is therefore important to integrate and carefully manage the functions, activities, and behavior of staff who produce and deliver services to customers. The first learning outcome building your service culture. First, we need to refer to the meaning of a corporate culture. The cultural framework of an organization consists of three important elements. These are structure, systems, and people. Structure, on the one hand, relates to the formal reporting channels as shown on the organizational chart or organogram. Systems, then, refer to the people management systems used for control, evaluation, promotion, and recognition. One of the key problems in enhancing the quality of service delivery is placing contact personnel who fit in terms of service orientation, skills and capabilities into the hierarchy of the service organization. There is a short video that is also linked on Ifundi that explains corporate culture. A service provider's corporate culture represents the values that are part of the organization and can be considered to be the internal climate in the organization. The internal climate is dependent on how the internal relationship function between people and the organization. Culture can thus be defined as the employee's accumulated sense of what is important in an organization. Another view of climate relates to employees' perceptions of one or more strategic issues. Commitment to excellence in service delivery among employees within the organization leads to a climate that sets excellence as its key strategic goal. Now, importantly, when an organization does not have a clear set of shared values, there will be a feeling of uncertainty among employees about how to respond to difficult situations, 
In the service environment, this uncertainty may result in inconsistency in flexible behavior by frontline employees, long waiting times and feeling of insecurity among customers. Now there's a lot of additional information regarding corporate culture on page 201 and 202. The next focus will be creating your service culture or developing your service culture. A service culture can only be developed over time and there is no quick fix solution if it is absent. The human resources and internal marketing practices that are adopted can, however, help develop a service culture in an organization. A service culture can be described as a culture where an appreciation for good service exists and where giving good services to internal as well as ultimate external customers is considered a natural way of life and one of the most important norms by everyone involved. Service orientation can be considered as shared values and attitudes that influence people in an organization in such a manner that interactions between them internally and interactions with customers and representatives of other external parties are perceived favorably. Now there's a strong link between service culture and the service process and a strong relationship between the service process and service quality. Organizations, therefore, should ensure that they have well-developed systems, procedures and processes in place to ensure that the service can be delivered to the customer to satisfy the proposed value proposition. In short, the intended policies in terms of culture and processes are implemented as management practices. Now, it boils down to the four requirements that are necessary for the establishment of a service culture and these are very important. These include strategic requirements or your strategy, your organizational requirements in terms of your structure, your management requirements in terms of developing leadership, and then also knowledge and attitude requirements. We will have a look at these four requirements briefly, but do make sure that you look at these in detail in your textbook. The service strategy stipulates what should be done to whom how, what resources will be used, and the customer benefits that will be part of the service offering. It is important that service concepts be aligned with the business mission. An important part of service strategy and culture is human resource management, which includes attracting suitable employees, recruitment, career planning, training and development, appropriate performance evaluation, and effective reward systems. In terms of developing your organizational structure or organizational requirements, there are three considerations that you should bear in mind. First, successful marketing requires a marketing-centered attitude throughout the organization. Most marketing takes place during the service encounters and in the administrative support to service encounters by means of customer-oriented part-time or back-office marketers. Secondly, the responsibility for marketing falls to line managers, but the chief executive has to accept ultimate responsibility for its successful implementation. Thirdly, a formal marketing department may be required to take responsibility for centrally implemented marketing activities, such as strategic marketing planning. Every facet of organizational design, however, has to be aligned with the service processes so that the goal of excellence in service delivery can be realized in a consistent manner. Owing to the nature and characteristics of services, such as direct person-to-person -person service delivery and simultaneous delivery and consumption, a service organization often requires a relatively flat organizational structure with limited hierarchical levels or levels of management. This flat structure implies that frontline employees often assume more responsibility, work more independently, and have more discretionary power to make on-the-spot decisions that would normally be expected. A distinction is drawn between three types of discretion. Routine discretion, creative discretion, and deviant discretion. Routine discretion is exercised when the potential means of performing service tasks are available to service staff based on training, past experience, external search activities, or from a list of discretionary options provided by the organization. Creative discretion is exercised when a service employee is given a task, but the means of accomplishing the task is developed by the employee. Then lastly, deviant discretion occurs when employees have exercised inappropriate discretion criteria according to the organization, 
during routine or creative discretion instances, and there are several examples on page 205. One of the key organization-related considerations in service delivery is the level of standardization or customization inherent in the service offering. Another important aspect of organizational development is the establishment of efficient operational systems, procedures, routines, and workflows. And then lastly, information technology is often the enabler that provides the internal information and operational systems to facilitate service delivery. Next, we need to develop our leadership, and this boils down to management or managerial requirements. Service-oriented leadership is a prerequisite for the development of a service culture. Leaders of successful service organizations tend to have similar core values, such as integrity, joy, and respect, and they infuse those values into the fabric of their organization in terms of their employees. The role of managers and supervisors is therefore to encourage and motivate staff, provide guidance, demonstrate leadership, and create a climate in which service excellence and satisfied customers are shared goals. Communication is a critical ingredient of leadership and leaders should be able to create a dialogue with their staff and provide clear direction and guidance. Now lastly, knowledge and attitude requirements. Sometimes resistance to change to or to the establishment of service culture can be attributed partly to a negative attitude and a lack of knowledge among employees. Knowledge needs relate to questions like how does a service organization function? What is meant by customer relationships? What is the role of the individual in the service design and delivery process? What is expected of the individual employee? Everyone should be knowledgeable about the organization's mission, strategies, and goals, and about your own department's objectives as well as one's own goals. Training employees and thereby improving their knowledge and influencing their attitudes towards service excellence are an integral aspect of internal marketing and is discussed later as part of Learning Outcome 6. In the next topic, we will have a look at boundary spanning roles as well as the sources of conflict that they experience. But first, have a look at this very funny video of how not to be a frontline or boundary spanning employee. Now I'm busy and you're late, so let's not waste any more time, eh? But I've been waiting out there for the last half hour. Whatever. Listen, champ. You're a very valuable customer to Well, us. the reason I've got... So I'm going to sign you up for something you haven't even asked for. You can't do that. Already in the system. Well, I want to make a complaint. <laughs> Not my department. How about I transfer you to an automated service that will promise to get back to you? Then I want to speak to the manager. That'd be... Me. But I'm in a meeting. Barbara lives in bank world. Go away. But... So, as part of learning outcome two and five, you can refer to the topic starting on page 208. In the eyes of the customer, frontline service employees are integral to the service experience and as a result, often perform three distinct roles. They are operation specialists and marketers, but they are also part of the service product. These employees occupy boundary spanning positions and provide a link between the external environment and internal operations. Employees in these positions have two main functions, so they are information transfer and representation. In other words, boundary spanning employees collect information from the environment, especially from customers, and provide feedback to the organization and vice versa. They play a critical role in understanding, filtering, and interpreting information to and from the organization and its external stakeholders. You will also see that boundary spanners are also the organization's representatives. There are three key dimensions of customer linking behaviors of frontline service employees, FSEs, who fulfill boundary spanning roles, and this you will find on page 208. The roles of the staff who occupy boundary spanning positions can be classified along a continuum that ranges from subordinate service roles to professional roles. Examples again on page 208. What are the sources of conflicts that these boundary spanning employees face? Boundary spanning positions require individuals to possess skills beyond mere physical and mental skills, and this requirement is sometimes referred to as emotional labor. These jobs are susceptible to stress, and under these circumstances, frontline staff often have to suppress their negative emotions and still deliver an excellent service. Now, conflict can occur in boundary spanning roles and includes personal conflicts, organizational customer conflicts, and intercustomer conflicts. So let's have a look at these briefly. And then you need to make sure you understand these and be able to read through a case study and identify the type of conflict as well as provide an example of such conflict. 
personal role conflicts. So sometimes customers expect a service employee to be subservient and the employee might not want to play the role because it is inconsistent with his or her self-perceptions. In terms of organization customer conflicts, conflict can result when the organization expects the employee to behave in a certain way while the customer wants the service performed in a different way. When there are conflicts between customers, the boundary spanning staff are usually expected to resolve this. At times, conflict can occur for boundary spanners when incompatible expectations arise from two or more customers. There are several examples in the textbook. And then, as I mentioned, there are three key dimensions of customer linking behaviors of frontline service employees. Jumping forward to learning outcome six, you will deal with internal marketing. Have a look on page 212, where you will see the services triangle. On top, you will see the company, then on the right, you will see the customers and then on the left, employees. And this is a triangle because each component has an influence on the other component. For example, the company makes promises through marketing communication to consumers. And then companies need to empower the employees by enabling the promise so that the employees can make this promise made by the company to customers. But now you have to make sure as the employee, you need to deliver the promise that the company set out. Now, what is the making the promise referred to? This is external marketing. Enabling your employees is referred to as internal marketing. And then delivering the promise is interactive marketing where the employees interact with customers, usually frontline or boundary spanners. In terms of the internal customers, the nature and quality of services will primarily depend on the attitude and actions of the service employees or their service provider. Internal marketing is a management philosophy of treating employees as your customers based on the idea that employees come first. Remember back to the video of Richard Branson, the internal market for the organization. So they are internal in the micro environment of the organization. The concept of internal customers thus is used to describe the customer service provider relationship inside an organization where the internal service functions are performed by internal customers to the internal service providers who are also service providers to other internal customers. The implementation of principles of internal marketing demands a focus of good internal relationships between the staff at all levels in the organization and customers in order to create a service oriented staff culture among contact employees, support staff, team leaders, supervisors and managers. There are three core prerequisites for successful internal marketing. These requirements are that internal marketing be recognized as an integral part of strategic management. The organizational structure be supportive of internal marketing. Top management must consistently demonstrate active support for the internal marketing process. To be effective, there are two types of management processes that can be considered in the implementation of internal marketing. And this is attitude management and communications management. More about this on page 214 and 15. Now we go back in learning outcomes, but sequential in a textbook where we discussed learning outcome four. And here you have to illustrate the critical importance of service employees in service delivery, customer service, quality expectations, and customer satisfaction. And this can be done by looking at the strategies to deliver service quality through your people, meaning your employees. An organization must develop a competitive edge by establishing a service strategy of which internal marketing is a prominent part. Internal marketing ensures that customer oriented service promises are met by its employees. To build a customer oriented service minded workforce, your organization should first hire the right people, develop people to deliver service quality, provide the necessary support systems, and then also try to retain the best people in your organization. These concepts are discussed between pages 215 and 222, and in the middle of it, we will also touch on learning outcome three. Now, first, you have to hire the right and appropriate people for your organization. What does this entail? So as a company, you need to compete for the best people. In the recruitment environment, an organization has to compete with similar organizations to get the best people. This approach is referred to as competing for talent market share. Once potential employees have been identified, the organization should carefully interview the candidates and focus specifically on the service competencies and service inclination. One way to attract the best people is to be known as the preferred employee. Employer. And this relates to extensive training, career and advancement opportunities, superb internal support, attractive incentives and a service with which employees are proud to be associated. 
just a top tip for you guys. When you have a LinkedIn profile and you have your qualifications, you have some work experience, you need to go through a few tips to set up your profile for recruiters because LinkedIn is the perfect professional portal where recruiters look for potential employees. And then a lot of employees are recruited on LinkedIn based on what you provide on your profile. So make sure you go find out on Google, a simple Google search, how to have a perfectly set up LinkedIn profile where people can hire the right people. Hopefully you one day when you are done with your degree and have several years of experience. Next, you have to develop your people to deliver service quality. Once an organization has hired and placed employees, the next phase is to develop them to ensure optimal service performance. Training is one of the most important internal marketing activities and is a basic component of internal marketing programs. There are three types of service training that should be offered. First, you need to develop a holistic view of the organization. You need to develop skills to execute required tasks. And then you need to develop specific communication and service skills. More about this on page 217. Next, as part of developing your people to deliver service quality, you need to empower your employees. You need to make sure of enfranchisement and then also promote teamwork. And this is part of Learning Outcome 3. The enabling concept is part of the process of creating the appropriate conditions required for the successful implementation of empowerment. Enabling means simply that employees need management support, knowledge support and technical support to be able to make independent decisions in the service delivery process. Also, empowerment suggests that frontline employees especially should be given the discretion to meet the needs of customers creatively. Empowerment therefore entails giving employees the desired skills, tools and authority to serve the customer as they see fit. There are also several benefits of empowerment that you have to consider. So if you empower your employees, it will lead to quicker and more direct responses to customers' needs in the service delivery process. It will also result in a quicker and more direct response to dissatisfied customers' complaints. Also, employees will feel more satisfied with their own jobs. Frontline employees treat customers more enthusiastically. Empowered employees become a valuable source of new ideas because they are involved and empowered and then frontline staff increase customer retention. Next, you will see figure 8.2 that shows you the level of employee autonomy in terms of empowerment. You can have a look at this in detail on page 218 to 219. Another concept we have to look at is enfranchisement. And this goes beyond empowerment and requires that after employees have been empowered, a system be linked to the performance of the staff whereby they are rewarded for customer-oriented behaviors. There's no sense in empowering your employees without rewarding them. To be effective, rewards should comply with the following requirements, and this includes availability, flexibility, reversibility, contingency, visibility, timeliness, and durability. More detail on each of these concepts on page 219 to 220. Another thing to consider is teamwork. The nature of many service organizations is such that customer satisfaction will increase when employees work coherently in well-integrated teams. Employees who know that they have team support and backing will experience the work as less demanding and will feel more enthusiastic about delivering services to an exceptional quality. By promoting teamwork in your organization, the organization can enhance the employee's abilities to deliver excellent service while the camaraderie and support enhances their inclination to be excellent service providers. After you hired the correct people and developed your people to deliver service quality, now you have to provide the necessary support systems. It is indispensable that internal support systems that are aligned with the need to focus on the customer be given to service workers. One of the areas in which support is crucial is providing frontline employees with the correct equipment and technology. It is important for the service organization to create an environment that supports frontline employees because they are instrumental in ensuring that the customer's experience is delivered and designed. This support can be institutionalized in formal systems and processes, or it can be done informally by means of recognition, reward, and involvement of top management. Now you've done all of the three steps. Now you need to make sure you retain the best people. There are three ways to enhance employee retention. And this can be done to include your employees in the company's vision, to treat your employees as customers, and also measure and reward strong service performers. That is it for this unit. If you have any questions regarding the content, please make sure to contact your lecturer.